The February 10th, 1994 episode of Eye to Eye with Connie Chung. Not me. Not Eye to Eye with Ken Dixon. That's different. Featured Tanya Harding, who was right in the midst of the whole Nancy Kerrigan attack controversy. As it turned out, her husband had contracted a hitman to go into smash her knee, did it at Cobo Arena, and uh, it, it was a great drama. I mean, they ended up on the Olympics and competed with each other and ignoring each other. And, you know, Tanya, of course, was like not your typical skater chick, you know. She wasn't a preppy little girl. She was more from the trailer park side of Portland, which if you've ever been to Portland, oh my goodness. So check out this cool, cool, cool bit of TV history. It's even referenced on Wikipedia, but the link's broken because I had posted it without an intro. So here's an intro for you people. An interesting intro, eye to eye. An eye to eye intro. The eye in intro. There you go, YouTube. Hi, I'm Connie Chun. Tonight on Eye to Eye. I'm gonna go out with a bang. The interview America has been waiting for. Tanya Harding breaks her silence. An Eye to Eye Network exclusive. Why didn't you go to authorities immediately? Because I was afraid. Afraid of what? Being hurt. By whom? People. Tonight, an emotional Harding talks about her role in the skating scandal and about the man who turned on her, ex-husband Jeff Galuli. I just want to know why. I never did anything to hurt him. You didn't? If I ever did anything, it was to stick up for him and protect him. And he does this to me. And we'll take you to Lillehammer, where the next chapter in the drama is about to unfold. Also, outrage at West Point. How did white cadets look at Johnson Whitaker? Oh, they, they, they thought he had absolutely no business being there. Uppity. Uppity. A former slave tortured, then drummed out of the Corps for the crime of being black. Three masked people are in the room, and they say that if you don't leave, uh, we are going to kill you. Now, more than 100 years later, a remarkable family may see justice done. What has what happened to your grandfather done to your family? Those stories and more tonight on Eye to Eye. It's Eye to Eye with Connie Chung, with correspondents Bernard Goldberg, Edie Magnus, Russ Mitchell, Roberta Baskin, and Bill Lagatuta. Good evening. Never have the words Olympic hopeful had more meaning than in the case of Tanya Harding. In Portland, a court will hold a hearing tomorrow on Harding's appeal for a temporary restraining order to postpone Tuesday's U.S. Olympic Committee hearing in Oslo. That hearing could lead to her expulsion from the Winter Games. Harding also filed a $20 million lawsuit against the committee. Tonight, Tanya Harding comes forward for an exclusive network interview. Because she is under investigation by Olympic and skating officials, as well as authorities in Portland, Harding's lawyers advised her not to discuss certain details of the case. And now, you'll see a Tanya Harding you've never seen before. I like myself. You do? You like yourself? Yeah, I do. Well, I think that people um, like it that I have an open mind and that I'll tell them what I feel. Of course, there's always the other side that you can be a little too blunt. Yes, but isn't it always better to tell the truth? You guys aren't allowed in the store. We're sorry. Okay, thanks. The truth is what everyone wants to hear from Tanya Harding. Can you say that's just not true? Those are lies. Tanya, how you doing? Are you still planning on going to the Olympics? But I still want to represent my country. It may seem as if her life is spinning out of control. But this blue-collar kid didn't get to be a world-class skater by giving up or changing who she is. I'm my own person. You guys, will you go away, please? I may not go to 
um, the opera and and go to expensive dinners all the time. You know, I like to go four wheeling. I like to go bowling. I like to shoot pool. I like to do those kind of things. And I don't think it makes me a bad person because I have a lot of hobbies. So, how are you doing? I mean, you know, in terms of... Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. The past month hasn't been easy. She may be the national champ, but according to a CBS News poll, most of the public thinks she is lying. She's in the fight of her life. People who know you say you actually skate better under adversity. When your life is going smoothly, you don't skate as well. When your life is a wreck, you do. I do skate better under pressure. Um, I like being the underdog. I like it when nobody expects me to do anything. And then I can come out and I can just walk away with it. When I hit the ice, it's my getaway. Mr. Cooley, are you guilty of the allegations as stated by your attorney? I am. There is no escaping the reality. Her ex-husband, Jeff Galuli, pleading guilty in the plot to attack Nancy Kerrigan. Telling investigators that Tanya Harding not only knew about the attack, but gave the final okay. Whatever happens in court, in our interview, Harding began laying the groundwork for her defense to the public, her version of the battered woman syndrome. How did Jeff treat you? He's hit me before, punched me. Is it true that he threatened to break your legs and end your career? There was one time he said he'd break my legs, so I couldn't do anything, so I couldn't make money, so I couldn't have my career, my dream. Why would he do that? Why would he say something like that? I don't know. I thought that if somebody loved me, they wouldn't say stuff like that. Well, Jeff Galuli today says he still loves you. Do you still love him? Why not? Because if somebody loved me, they wouldn't do this to me. Meaning, what has he done to you? Lie about me, not tell the truth. He has implicated you in the Nancy Kerrigan attack. Serious, detailed charges. Both what Jeff and Sean say is not true. Anybody who knows me knows it's not true. Does it hurt? I just want to know why. I never did anything to hurt him. You didn't? If I ever did anything, it was to stick up for him and protect him. And he does this to me. We can't talk about the specifics. Sure. And, uh, you know, yes. we're just as anxious to talk to you guys as you are to us, and there'll be more. It was just a few weeks ago that Tanya and Jeff were dealing with this together, a familiar pattern in their on-again, off-again marriage. Over the years, Tanya has filed police reports charging Jeff with abuse and harassment, but she later retracted her complaints. Then why did you stick with him? Because I thought it was the right thing to do. How could you think it was the right thing to do if he was beating you and abusing you? I thought I must have been doing something wrong. And so I'd try even harder to be good, you know, to be nice. Ask permission to go places, ask permission to spend money. Everyone says you're independent, strong-minded, you say what you feel, but didn't you fight back? I tried once, and it didn't work. What happened? I got beat up. I had to call the police. I had to call my friends to come and get me and see me like that. But what her friends and family can't understand is why she kept going back. I think for all the skeptics who felt Tanya's peak had passed, I think she's proved she's still... I always wanted to have the image that the figure skating people wanted me to have. And so I'd try really hard. <clears throat> And that's one of the reasons why I went back, because they always thought that it was, it was stable when I was with him. So I wanted them to try and see me as a stable person. But I'm not. I'm more stable when I'm not with him. 
I can skate. But in the end, what may keep Tanya Harding off the ice are her own words days after the attack. I didn't do anything wrong, and neither did anybody else. Yeah, I don't know anything. I don't know for sure anything about what's going on at all. On words she later contradicted with her own damaging admission. I am responsible, however, for failing re for failing to report things I learned about the assault when I returned home from nationals. Did you have prior knowledge of the planned attack on Nancy Kerrigan? No, I did not. Absolutely not? Absolutely not. I know you can't discuss the facts of the case, but in your statement that you read to reporters, you said, I learned that some persons close to me were involved in the assault. Yes. Why didn't you go to authorities immediately? Everything just happened so fast. It just, boom, everything. And I was sick, I was scared. Afraid of what? Being hurt. By whom? People. Can you say who? No. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for. Please, welcome back to the ice, Miss Nancy Kerrigan. If the attack was meant to eliminate the competition, it backfired, turning Nancy Kerrigan into a hero. Endorsements, movie deals, and the cheers of America. Nancy Kerrigan has this image of being a darling princess, and you have this image, perhaps clearly from the media, of being a bad girl. How does that make you feel? Everybody has their opinion, you know? have tried hard enough to express to Nancy Kerrigan um, how you feel about this incident. I feel really sorry. I really do. Um, I even wrote her a small letter and I don't know if she received it or not, but I tried to say I was sorry that this all happened. Do you think it got through to her? I don't know. Have you heard back from Nancy Kerrigan? No. You may very well be practicing with Nancy Kerrigan on the ice. Is it going to be awkward? I don't know. The first time you see her, do you think you're going to be nervous? Probably. She's going to be your teammate at the Olympics. And that makes it difficult, don't you think? I don't know. Today, Harding remains a member of the team, but competing in the games is still a big question. Her $20 million lawsuit against the U.S. Olympic Committee is a strong signal of her determination to skate in Lillehammer. Why do you believe you should be allowed to skate at the Olympics? Because I've worked 20 years for it. I mean, it's my dream, and I think I deserved it. I mean, I went to nationals, and I, I won. And it looks like that's the case. Tanya Harding has delivered her challenge. Will you said in your statement, I have done nothing to violate the standards of excellence and sportsmanship that are expected in an Olympic athlete. I said what I believe, what I believe to be true. I just go out and do the best that I can, do the best that anyone expects me to do. If I'm not perfect, it doesn't mean that, you know, I did something wrong. What would you do if you can't skate at this Olympics? I don't know. Cry. In just a few moments, Tanya Harding talks about what she'll do if her Olympic dream does come true. Have you thought about the possibility that if you go out and skate at the Olympics that you might even be booed? 
Because of this still breaking story, we're going to postpone our report on the highly controversial treatment program for severely disabled children that we had scheduled for this evening. We will bring it to you when we return after the Olympics. But coming up, the making of Tanya Harding, a superstar on the edge. Most of my life she always told me I skated like crap and I think that that had a lot to do with the hate relationship that I had for her. Also, emotions run high, but is there enough hard evidence to indict Tanya Harding? An Olympic panel is judging Tanya Harding's ethics, but the law will judge her innocence. In the midst of allegations and rumors fueling this bizarre scandal, there's also the search for hard evidence. Tanya Harding has admitted she failed to report what she found out about the attack after the fact. But is there proof that she was actually in on it? CBS News correspondent John Blackstone has been covering this story in Portland. John? Connie, the criminal case that's been unfolding in this Portland courtroom is temporarily being overshadowed by all the other urgent legal maneuvering. But it's here the big questions will ultimately be answered. Will Tanya Harding be charged? And if she is, will she be found guilty? But after a month of investigation, arrests, and confessions, there remains a distinct lack of evidence actually linking Harding to the attack on Nancy Kerrigan. And as incredible as it may sound, what may be the most significant evidence yet was turned up by a woman named Kathy Peterson in the garbage behind her restaurant. As I was going through one of the bags, I found this envelope with the name of Jeff Galuli on it. And so, of course, it piqued my curiosity, and I went digging a little farther. So far, the most tantalizing exhibit against Harding is also the strangest. I called the FBI with the things that I found and gave them the original things that I'd found. Behind Kathy Peterson's dockside restaurant, some scribbled notes found in the garbage could be the smoking gun, if this is Tanya Harding's handwriting. The names and numbers found in the trash seem to support claims that Harding collected information about the Tony Kent Arena on Cape Cod, where Kerrigan trains. But prosecutor Norm so Frank isn't boasting he's cracked the case. Well, I mean, I think it's uh, public record that there's been this envelope discovered and uh, that it's been uh, turned over to the authorities along with some other uh, with some other material that was found, but we can't comment on it beyond that. But what a discovery. Kathy Peterson was simply trying to catch the people dumping their trash in her dumpster. So when I find bags that didn't come from my place, I go through them looking for a name or number of someone to contact to let them know that, you know, this can't be done. You can't be good putting your trash in other people's dumpsters. If the notes are genuine, their discovery would seem to set some sort of new standard for either criminal stupidity or bad luck. But then this case is littered with improbable characters and surprising revelations. <laughs> Sean Eckert, the man who dreamed of being a bodyguard to the stars, saw Harding as his route to prominence. But Eckert seems to have told almost everybody he knew about the plot to injure Kerrigan. Did he come in, Sean? And once arrested, he told the FBI Harding helped get information about Kerrigan's practice schedule. But Detective Jerry Spires has his doubts. The guy distorts reality. I think he was uh, a, local, a local kid uh, who wanted to be big time. The trail from Eckerd quickly led to hitman Shane Stan and to the man who drove the getaway car, Derek Smith. But both of them have told the FBI, as far as they know, Harding was not involved. So in what has become a game of who do you trust, to believe Tanya Harding is guilty, you have to trust Jeff Gillooly. His 17-hour talk with the FBI contains the most damning charges against Harding, that she led the hitmen to Kerrigan. Gillooly's attorney, Ron Hovitt, says phone records support that. Same that afternoon, Tanya called the Tony Ken Arena from her home to determine Nancy Kerrigan's practice schedule. That sounds a lot like the scribbled notes Kathy Peterson found in her dumpster. But much of the evidence Gillooly has provided is impossible to verify. He claims that as he and Harding were driving past this freeway intersection on December 28th, she approved the attack on Kerrigan, saying, let's do it. All right. In court this week, prosecutors put the case on hold until Harding gets back from the Olympics. That would seem to suggest that you don't really have the goods on her. I, you know, we're not going to characterize the state of the evidence or 
or anything like that. And uh, it, uh, I think a lot of people have drawn a lot of erroneous conclusions from a lot of things in this whole uh, affair. Jeff Galuli, who pleaded guilty in this courtroom, seems determined not only to see his former wife prosecuted, but to end her Olympic career. He quickly offered to go to Norway to testify against Harding before the Olympic Committee. But with all the other legal maneuvers now going on, the Olympic Committee seems less than anxious to talk to Galuli. Connie? Thank you. John Blackstone. Her skating may look flawless, but Tanya Harding has already taken enough personal spills to last a lifetime. At 23, she has split several times from her ex-husband, Jeff Galuli. Her relationship with her mother, who has had five husbands, has been just as tempestuous. Tonight, as we go eye to eye with Tanya Harding, the skater looks ahead to the Olympics and back at the road that has brought her so close. Knowing that there's some really good skaters who are gonna be at the Olympics, what's going through your head? I think I have a little bit of an edge over them because I've already been to an Olympics. I know what to expect. Um, 20 years in the skating business. <laughs> It's a long time. <laughs> if she does skate in Lillehammer, Tanya Harding says it will be her final appearance as an amateur. If you are allowed to skate at the Olympics, do you think that you'll be judged fairly? That's all I want. I just want to go to Olympics and be able to skate and be, you know, treated fairly, be judged fairly. Have you thought about the possibility that if you go out and skate, on the ice at the Olympics that you might even be booed? No, I don't even think about that. And the most important thing to me is just going and being able to skate and follow through with my dream. It's a dream that began years ago. Tanya Harding was different and she knew it. Tanya, do you remember the first time you put on a pair of skates? My parents and I were at Lloyd Center and it's a mall and we were shopping and I was three years old and I looked over and was watching the kids skate and uh, I said I wanted to do that and they said no no you can't do that and so I just started bawling my eyes out and finally they they kind of let in and said okay and I used to kick the ice and stuff like that so I could eat it but um, <laughs> it, it was pretty cool I really liked it and I told my mom and dad that I wanted to do it again and they thought you know when you're three years old you don't know what you want and, but, you know, here I am today, 20 years later. Where do you get that drive and that uh, determination to be challenged? If somebody says, you can't do it, then you say, I'm going to knock it out of the ballpark. Watch me. That's just me. I, I'm very motivated by people who tell me I can't do something. Um, all my life, people have never believed in me. Every time I'd get her off the ring, she'd stick her tongue out at me and say, I'm not coming off. Her mother, Sandy Golden, knew it too, and talked to us about it. There was a few times I had to get rental skates, go out on the ice, get her off of the ice so that I could go to home and go to work. Life was not really easy growing up. I didn't have a lot of money. Um, my parents and I, we used to go around and pick up bottles and cans to help pay for ice time and stuff like that sometimes. And she chased cans and bottles up and down the roads between Portland and Estacada. So uh, she worked hard for what she got, and I think she deserved every bit of it. Al Harding says his daughter was determined to succeed, determined even though there was practically no money. Did you feel badly about that when you were growing up and different? I felt different. I didn't have very many friends. I maybe had one friend. Um, when I was a child, we moved basically 13 times before I was the age of 16. And so I wasn't around too many schools for very long. Um, my mom didn't want me to have a lot of friends because she thought it would be disruptive. And so I never got to stay the night at anybody's house, you know, go to um, slumber parties or dances or anything. Really? Mm -hmm. You weren't allowed because your mother wouldn't allow you to? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Al divorced when Tanya was 15. And by then, a pattern had developed. A pattern of tight control by Tanya's mother. A pattern, Tanya says, of abuse. Was she abusive to you, verbally and physically? Yeah. What exactly did she do? Did she, did she actually beat you? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, I know now that it was because of alcohol. Were you scared of her? 
when you were little? I don't know. It's just something I've dealt with all my life. I figured, well, if my mom hits me, it doesn't matter because she loves me. That's what I always thought. And so, you know, all my life, that's the way I've thought. If somebody hits me, it, you know, it doesn't mean anything. And, you know, they love me. I wouldn't call myself an abusive mother, not abusive ever. Corrective, maybe. <laughs> well, some people, I guess, can say that, you know, but there's a lot of people out there no different. Well, we had problems, but they weren't that big of problems. We always managed to get them straightened out. It's about all anybody can do. Even though that turbulence seems far behind her, Tanya Harding is taking an unconventional step. She said she wants a new family. Close friends David Weber, his and wife, and their daughter Stephanie. I believe now that I have a real family. Um, Stephanie's parents um, are going to adopt me soon. Really? And so I can have a real family and a real sister and brothers. And I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, I've never had anything like that. Is that something you've always wanted? Yeah, I've always wanted to have a family. I always wanted to, somebody to love me for me. But don't you think your father loves you for you? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. is, that, is this gonna hurt him at all? No, you because sure? we're all kind of, all big one happy family. And what about your mother? I don't see my mother that very much. You know, she comes to the rink and sees me skate, but that's about it. Tanya and her mother are closer now, but they see each other in public places. They are rarely together. They rarely talk. <laughs> are you a little better up here if you don't have to see her that much? I'm a little better if she doesn't put me down. I mean, you know, right, recently she's been really good, and she says that, you know, I look good and I'm skating great. And, but most of my life she always told me I skated like crap. I was too fat. I never, I'm never gonna win, I'm never gonna beat these people, I'm never gonna do anything. And so it was really hard. And I think that that had a lot to do with the hate relationship that I had for her. But memories, especially childhood ones, are sometimes bad ones. Tanya Harding remembers her mother wanting her to quit. Did your parents want you to skate? Most of the time. My dad was mostly always behind me. He says, whatever you wanna do. But there was a lot of times that my mom wanted me to quit. And I don't know why. You don't? I just think maybe she didn't want me to be in the limelight or anything. Matter of fact, I even bought her a horse trying to get her out of skating. You bought her a horse? Yeah, a little pony. Trying to get her out of skating. She took the pony and she says, now I can have a pony and skate too. And she was just tickled pink. But then... It turned out she couldn't give up skating and I couldn't have both. So we had to sell the horse. For Tanya Harding, skating has always been her ticket out, her passport to success. But she says that's not all she wants out of life. If you are not allowed to skate at the Olympics, it is because of an ugly incident. Can you live with that? I'll hope that I can go on. I have to. I can't let this ruin me. I've worked too hard, too long, 20 years. You know, I just want to have a good life for myself and maybe someday a family. I just want to not have to worry. I don't want it to be the same when I was growing up for my children. I mean, in some ways, my mom taught me a really, really important lesson, you know, and... What is that lesson? To respect them, to respect your children, let them do what they want to do, I mean, in guidelines, <laughs> but to basically to respect them. And I know that I will respect them because I know I didn't get it. This interview was obviously Tanya Harding's attempt to make her case to the American public. Both she and Nancy Kerrigan stand to make big money from book, movie, or television deals. Harding says she intends to use some of the money she receives from her current notoriety to set up a trust for Special Olympics children. Later, Tanya Harding makes her fans a promise 
an Olympic promise. But next, wait till you hear what the rest of the world thinks of Tanya. The Olympics don't get underway until Saturday, but Lillehammer is already buzzing with the one topic that's on everyone's mind. Whatever Olympic officials decide about whether she's allowed to skate, Tanya Harding has the dubious honor of being the most infamous athlete in this year's Olympics. 48 Hours correspondent Susan Spencer is in the center of the action. Susan? Connie Lillehammer and everybody in Lillehammer just wants to know one thing about this whole issue, and that is the truth, the whole truth. Then they can figure out what, if anything, the U.S. Olympic Committee ought to do about it. They are swirling in the midst of the biggest controversy ever to hit the sport. But Olympic skaters here are trying to hold concentration. They act as if they've never heard of Tonya Harding. Figure skating pairs practice this morning at the same hammer rink where Harding hopes to redeem her reputation, personal and professional, if the United States Olympic Committee gives her a chance. But some, like Czech skater Radka Kavarikova, already have made up their minds. I think she should not skate. Tanya knew about who did it before the policemen found out who did it. With Lillehammer gearing up for the big day, there are very few in this picturesque little town without an opinion. Thank you. And thousands of journalists here are feeding the frenzy worldwide, often at the expense of reporting on their own country's athletes. The Japanese, always big on personal responsibility, seem mystified that Harding hasn't publicly apologized for what happened. Most of the feeling of the uh, Japanese people is she is guilty. Do you think that this story has gotten too much coverage? I don't think so. This story is universal. The French have a skater of their own who's considered a favorite, no matter. French channels two and three have devoted as much time to Harding and Kerrigan as they have to her. In France, uh, they don't know why they, they are too two girl, very beautiful girl, and why the violence is present in the, in, in, the, in the sport and in the skating. It's like days of our lives on ice. And then there are the Australians. I don't think uh, Australians can resist a good story, and this is a hell of a story. The sensational assault case that has since rocked the sport. So it's been on every night. It is, after all, the Aussies say, the best soap opera America has exported in a long time. Given the elements of sex and glamour and a possible crime and even possible retribution at the Olympics. Retribution at the Olympics? Well, if they both skate, the result says it, doesn't it? Who was meant to be here? Who wasn't meant to be here? More to the point right now, who will be here? Though the skaters didn't show up for practice today, all the names were up there on the board. And the inside betting is that in the end, Tonya Harding will skate on this ice. But Harvey Schiller, the executive director of the U.S. Olympic Committee, notes that the rules still require all American athletes to stick to the Olympic code of conduct. So, what does that mean in this case? We're facing some things that take us beyond the boundaries of sport. You know, most people like sport because it uh, has a winner and loser, usually a few ties here and there. But this is going to go on well into the future, and there's certainly precedent for conduct issues and other things to be considered. An imposing array of 1,000 athletes takes the Olympic oath. Actually, Olympic precedents are pretty confusing. In 1924, marksman William Silkworth competed in Paris, although he was under indictment for fraud. He won gold and later was convicted. But in 1936, officials threw backstroke gold medalist Eleanor Holm Whalen off the team for too much partying. What about this story of your drinking champagne? I did drink some champagne because I liked it. More recently, sprinter and 1988 silver medalist Butch Reynolds was suspended after he tested positive for drugs. Butch Reynolds has to really go. He successfully sued the International Amateur Athletic Federation and won $27 million. But never before has there been a case where one athlete is accused of involvement in a direct attack on another. 
and here in Lillehammer, consumed at the moment with goodwill and Olympic idealism, with fair play and sportsmanship, that's all many people need to know. People shouldn't uh, hurt each other uh, to get a place on, on the Olympic Games. It's not a very nice thing to do, is it? You think she should be able to skate? No, I don't think so. You don't? No. Why not? Oh, because uh, I think she has something to do with the case. Harding, uh, uh... But Harding also has defenders, even here. But as long as people don't know for sure if she's done this, we welcome her to Lilanga. Back at the rink, where a gold can mean honor and glory and millions of dollars, there's an undercurrent of concern. Tanya Harding arrives soon and is even slated to practice at the same time and place as rival Nancy Kerrigan. I think everybody will be careful about her because um, we will not know if she was involved or no. So I think I'll be careful what to tell her, but you know. What do you mean you'll be careful? You oh, mean? Like, it, it will not be like it is to be talking to her. Because you don't know. Because I don't know. It is, Connie, a very strange environment for what are usually those inspiring words, let the games begin. There is a sense about this to just let this part of the games be over with. Connie? Thank you. Susan Spencer. Nancy Kerrigan arrived in Norway this morning and didn't waste any time getting outfitted for her team jacket and getting her Olympic credentials. And 13-year-old Michelle Kwan, who placed second in the Olympic trials and wound up as first alternate when Kerrigan was selected, was practicing as usual in Lake Arrowhead, California. The 88-pound wonder may be leaving for Norway this weekend, but she cannot live or practice with the team. What does the country think about all of this? A CBS News poll shows most Americans think if Tanya Harding is not charged with a crime, she should be allowed to skate in the Olympics. But do they believe her story, that she was not involved in the plot against Nancy Kerrigan? Nearly two-thirds say she is lying. Still ahead, Tanya Harding's final words. And when we come back, Johnson Whitaker was a black cadet at West Point. The trouble is, he was the only black cadet. Finally, we've heard a lot from Tanya Harding tonight, but to really understand her, you have to understand how much she really wants the dream she's worked for since she was three. And no matter how bad this nightmare is, she still truly believes when the U.S. Olympic skating team takes the ice, she will be there. I'm sure that everyone can expect the triple axel because it's, you know, going to be one of my last competitions. And uh, I want to end it at my peak top form. And that will be with triple axel. I want it to be a perfect program. It's at the perfect spot, you know. Olympics is the perfect place to do it, to be able to try and be perfect. Sound pretty darn determined. Mm -hmm. I can do it, and I will do it. People haven't seen it for a couple of years, so I'm going to go out with a bang. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll see eye to eye again three weeks from tonight after the Olympics. And I'll see you again tomorrow night with Dan Rather on the CBS Evening News. Good night, everybody. It will be anything but quiet on the set when Dave welcomes movie critics Siskel and Ebert, singer Daryl Hall, and the shortest man in the NBA, Muggsy Bogues, all coming up on tonight's Late Show with David Letterman. Mark McEwen here, thanking you for making CBS America's most watched network. Now, your local news. Thanks for watching Cleveland Live Music. If you like what you see, hit the subscribe button. There's Patreon and GoFundMe information as well.